their gauges. And faith has gauges. One of those gauges is joy. Amen. 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 The other one is peace. If you want to find out if you really believe in God about something and in faith, then you've got a, a joy gauge and a peace gauge, and they're doing good, right? Amen. And so, so thank God for, uh, for Jesus, and thank God we can believe him in crazy, crazy times and, uh, and see him come through. And we're seeing that, and I know you are too. And so we thank God for, for Nathan and Melinda, Pastor Nathan and Melinda. They're in Colorado right now. You think, you know, if you're in Colorado, you're, you're up there and it's real cold and you kind of picture a big fire. And I pulled the weather up there this morning just kind of spying on them a little bit. And, uh, and it's the same as it is here. I thought, man, come on, you've got to have some, got to have some cold when you're in Colorado. Praise the Lord. Uh, in, in 2020... Uh, which was a, a crazy year. Hadn't it been a few crazy years? Yeah. Isn't it interesting to, to, uh, to watch the dynamic of the church and everything through all of this and see what God is doing? That's what you keep your eyes on, not what the devil's doing, but what God is doing. And, uh, and God's doing some, some awesome things. And so, uh, you know, lots of, lots of things happened in the past three years that were very distracting. And, uh, and a lot of people got distracted. And, uh, but, but, you know, uh, God never got distracted. And the church is not distracted. The mission is still the same. When Jesus said to uh, his disciples, I'm going to build something that hell can't prevail against. Uh, think about what he had in his heart and what he was seeing during that time. That's what the church is all about. This morning, church is all about equipping and getting us to a place to where we're overcomers. Because that's what Jesus had in his heart. When he said, I'm going to build something hell can't prevail against, he's talking about a group of uh, people called out from the world and overcoming in this life. And also led by the Holy Spirit. You know, there's two things. I, I'm, I've said this before here, but I want to say it again. But there's two things that, uh, that I continue, continue to look at, and I think it's good to look at, to make sure that what I'm doing is on track as a minister, and I think churches need to keep these two things always in check, and that is the two things that Jesus said he was looking for. In the book of Revelation, when you've got seven churches there, and there were two things that were common throughout all seven of those churches that, that the Lord was looking for when he sent the messages to those churches in Revelations 2 and 3. Uh, one of them, he said, to him who overcomes... In every church, he said that after he told them what he liked about what was going on and what he didn't like about what was going on, what they were doing right, what they needed to change. At the very end, when he exhorted those churches, he said, to him who overcomes, and then he said things that, that they would receive uh, from, from living an overcoming life. And so Jesus has a vision in his heart of churches that overcome and that are filled with people who overcome. And faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And so uh, we're people that, that understand and learn and, and, and uh, are learning how to live by faith. Because faith, the lifestyle of faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Then he said this to every church, all seven churches. He said, to him who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. So another thing that he's looking for is spirit-led people, people who know the voice of the Holy Spirit, people who are led by the Holy Spirit, people who are empowered, living in the power of the Spirit. Glory to God. You know, we talk about what we've been redeemed from. We look at scriptures like Galatians where it says we've been redeemed from what? The curse of what? The law. Actually, in, in, in the Greek, it says this, that we've been redeemed. Galatians 3.13 says we've been redeemed from, from uh, the curse of having to obey the law to be right with God. So uh, the, the law, which is good, Paul said, is a good thing because it came from God. But it, it, it can't make you perfect. It can't make you holy. It can't make you righteous. There are good things that we learn and live by under the law, but, but there are some things that change from the old covenant to the new covenant. Amen. But in Galatians where it says that we're redeemed from the curse of the law, 
it's not just poverty and sickness and death. It's we're redeemed from having to, to live by rules and regulations to be right with God because Jesus made us right in his finished work. But it also lists two more things there where it talks about redemption because we're not just redeemed from something, we're redeemed to something. So when Jesus paid and shed his blood and paid the price for us, he didn't just redeem us from the curse, he didn't redeem us from just sickness and disease and, and lack and everything that could try to defeat us in life, but Jesus redeemed us to some things. The first thing he says, we've been, we've been redeemed from the curse uh, so that we could live in the blessing of Abraham. Abraham was the first person to live under a new covenant blessing. I don't know if you know that, but everything, our new covenant is actually based on the Abrahamic covenant. So when God came to Abraham, he made a covenant with Abraham that was based on faith. As long as Abraham believed in the goodness of God and believed God, then everything that God wanted to do, God was empowered and, and given the, the right to come in and do those things in Abraham's life. It was a credit to him righteousness because he believed the new covenant says. And so Jesus came and, uh, and redeemed us, bought us uh, out of the world, out of sin, redeemed us from the curse of the law, so that the blessing of Abraham could come on the Gentiles. That's you. Unless you're, unless you're Jewish, you're a Gentile. And hopefully, you know, even if you are Jewish, you understand that both groups need to be born again. You know, there's lots of people that get into things about the last days and they talk about, you know, are, are you, there's some people that are pro-Israel, there's some people that are pro-Palestinian. I'm pro-new creation. They all need to be born again. Amen. They all need to receive Jesus. He is the Messiah to the Jews and, and to the Gentiles. He's our Savior. But we're redeemed from the curse of the law. I'm not preaching yet, so don't, don't, don't take this out of my preaching time. <laughs> um, we're redeemed from the curse of the law so that, here's what we're redeemed to, so that the blessing of Abraham can come rightly on the Gentiles. You're qualified to be blessed today if you're in Christ. You're qualified for the blessings of Abraham. Before you do anything, before you pray, before you read your Bible, before you go to church, before you tell anybody about Jesus, you're qualified because Jesus qualified you. You actually don't have your own qualification. You have his qualification. So if Jesus is deserved, if he de is deserving to be blessed, then you're deserving to be blessed. If Jesus deserves to be healed, then you deserve to be healed because you stand in him, right. in his qualification. So redeemed from the curse, so that the blessing of Abraham can come on the Gentiles. And there's one more thing, so that we can walk in the power of the Spirit. So we're redeemed from the curse to the blessing and to a life that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. On Monday morning empowered by the Holy Ghost. You don't have to get up and pray an hour to have that. Now, prayer will help you, but it's not going to qualify you. Amen? Reading your Bible will help you, but it's not going to qualify you. Because only one thing qualifies you, and that's the blood of Jesus. Only one thing qualifies you to walk in, and, and give you the, the right and the freedom to, to be a, a, a son or daughter of God led by the Spirit of God, that's the blood. We're clean, holy, righteous, and qualified so that these blessings can come on us, so that we can walk in the power of the Spirit. So back in uh, a couple years ago, um, I wrote this book on prayer. The Lord, we were, Lisa and I were praying, uh, praying in the Holy Ghost. And we had barred somebody's church to go over and pray, and we were uh, praying about some things about our ministry and some things that the Lord would have us do. And, and we were praying in the Spirit. And this came up big in my heart to write a book on prayer. And I know there's thousands of books on prayer. And, uh, but <clears throat> the Lord directed us to do this. And, uh, and to write a book specifically about praying in the new covenant. Praying... Uh, in the covenant that we have with Jesus. Now, 
If you don't know this, <clears throat> if it's new to you, that's all right, but you really do need to know it. Things changed between the old and the new. One of those things that changed, in other words, we don't, we don't operate under an old covenant anymore. We're in a new covenant. Hebrews says we have a new covenant uh, uh, based on better promises, established on better promises. So the new is better than the old. Amen? Amen. And how many of you thank God you didn't have to bring a bull or a goat with you this morning? <laughs> and a big old knife, you know, and uh, to worship. We just got to sing with the ones that were singing up here and lift our hands and worship and experience God's presence and, and come before him, stand before him as if sin didn't even exist and we didn't even have to kill anybody or anything. <laughs> Nobody lost their life, not a goat, not a pigeon, not anything. Well, there's a lot of things that change and we understand some of the sacrifices and things like that. But did you know worship changed from the old to the new? If you didn't, you need, you need to know that. Because in the Old Testament, all they could do, because they didn't have the Spirit within, they, didn't, they weren't born again in the Old Testament, all they could do is worship from without. That's why it says David danced before the Lord with all his might. Because that's, how they, that's the only way they could worship, is to, you know, is, is the outward things. But worship now, Jesus said, to the woman at the well, he said that the Father seeks people to worship him, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, you need to understand that. I don't have time to go into it. That's one thing that changes is New Testament worship is different than Old, old Covenant worship. Another thing that changed in the, in the New Testament, uh, the big thing that changed is our approach to God. When I got born again, uh, I got born again in July of uh, 28, 1982. I was 16 years old. And to save you from doing all the math, I'm 56. But uh, I was 16 years old, got born again, got filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean, God was moving in my life. And I, I got a hold of, of a prayer series that was popular back then by a preacher by the name of Larry Lee. And it was called, Could You Not Tarry One Hour? So the goal of the whole teaching and, and the, uh, uh, that you went through, and I remember that big, huge teaching thing that I had filled with cassette tapes. Anybody remember cassette tapes? And I had the pages, you know, and it was a, big, it was a good study guide. The goal of it was to, was to pray an hour a day to get people stirred up about prayer. And so I started getting stirred up about prayer when I was uh, an older teenager and started spending time with the Lord, and, and I remember those times where I would pray and, you know, and, and, and think, man, it must have been, 45 minutes must have gone by, and I'd look at my watch, and it had been three or four minutes, you know, and, and uh, but it was, a, it was a lot of work in trying to, trying to do that, <clears throat> and, and, and the, the, this teaching taught this also, I'm not being critical about the teaching, but uh, because it was just what most people do when they, when they, when they don't really understand uh, the word is they, they, when they spend time with God, the first 10, 15 minutes is, is before they can really get into prayer is repentance. And so the first part of my prayer life was repentance. And I'd repent of things that I'd done, you know, every time I'd, because I felt like, you know, if, I, if I'm coming before the throne of God, I got I to gotta clean up a little bit, you know, you know, so I'd, I'd, that, I thought the access into God's presence was repentance. That was what I was using as my access card. Is when I came to God, I didn't think I could come to God unless I went through a time of repentance. And so I'd repent of what I've done, what I'd done, things that I thought I'd done that were wrong, things that were wrong, things that I didn't do that I thought about doing, and things that you know, and all the sins of omission and all these things. And I'd, I, I, it'd take me a while to get it all out. Anybody like me? And, and then I finally got to a place where I couldn't think of anything else. And then I'd say, Lord, and all those things that I can't think about, forgive me for those too, you know. And, and I'd finally get to a place where I felt like I could stand in God's presence because I had repented of all my sin. But the Bible doesn't say that repentance is your access to God. Now, repentance is important. 
when you sin, you, you should repent because part of repentance is you taking ownership of that and receiving what Jesus has done in his finished work for, for that and, and releasing your faith in the forgiveness that he's already accomplished for you. So repentance is important, but uh, it's not your access to God. You know, what, is, what is your access to God? Faith in what Jesus did. So when we come to God, we don't present ourselves to God as, as we are. We present ourselves to God in Christ. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 12 says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, verse 1, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves to God. Or, you know, be not, be not transformed uh, by the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Present yourself to God holy, acceptable. Well, I wouldn't come to God and present myself that way. I would come to God dirty and unclean and think, you know, I got to get all this repentance, gets all this stuff off of me so I can stand before God. But it really didn't. Number one, it really produced a more guilty conscience on the inside of me. Because I wasn't magnifying the blood of Jesus. I was magnifying what I had done. I kept looking at what I had done. And it, and it kept a sense of unworthiness in the forefront of my mind. And so when I learned that things changed from the old covenant to the new. See in the old covenant you did bring a sacrifice. It was a reminder of your sins. And every time you brought a sacrifice it was a reminder of your sins. But in the new covenant, we don't remind ourselves of sin. We remind ourselves of forgiveness. We remind ourselves of righteousness. We remind ourselves of what Jesus did in his finished work. And so our approach to God changed from the old covenant to the new. Worship changed. Our approach to, maybe I'm preaching. Maybe this is my message this morning. Uh, our approach to God, so when we come before him, we, we come clean by the blood. Amen. Not needing to be clean by the blood. We're clean. We're cleansed. Ephesians talks about all the things that you were in the world. You know, murderers and adulterers and fornicators. He said, so were some of you, but you were washed. Which means you're not that way anymore. Amen. And so all those things that I was and, and even, even the, the, the sins that, that I commit, you know, today. And some of you look at me like, what? Yeah, I'm just like you. You know, I only commit the sins that I like. I don't commit sins that I don't like, you know. And, and thank God there's mercy for that. And there's grace for it. Now, the, the goal is not to just live a life where we can just sin and do whatever we want. The goal is Christ-likeness. Yes. Amen? The goal is to live free from what Jesus has set us free from. And so I'm not, I'm not saying that that's, that's the goal is to just everything's okay now, so everything that you're doing is okay. That's not what I'm saying. But our approach to, to God has changed. So when we come and we worship and we come and we pray and we come and we fellowship with him, we don't come with a sense of guilt and inferiority. We come with boldness. Jesus said, or Paul said, or the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 4 said, that when we come before the throne of grace, we're supposed to come how? Boldly. Boldly. Confidently. Why? Because of what he did. So I come as a son. I come as his righteousness. I come qualified by the blood. And so when I stand before God, I stand before him cleansed because he's cleansed me as if sin never existed before now that'll change your prayer life that'll change your worship that'll change your your fellowship with god when you realize that when you get up in the morning you you stand up on beside the bed you're standing qualified you're standing the righteousness of god because of what jesus did not something you fall in and out of it's yours. He made you right. You weren't, you, you weren't made righteous by anything you did. So you're not made unrighteous by anything that you do. Amen. It's a standing. I'm, I'm, I, I'm not just giving a gift, even though righteousness is described as a gift in Romans 5. I don't just possess a gift. I am made 
the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, He made him to be sin who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. So I am righteous wall to wall. Every fiber of my being, every cell of my makeup is a righteous cell. Cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And I can stand before him as if sin never existed before. So now when I worship and when I pray, I don't come into him and spend all this time repentance. Because all of that repentance was based on a sin consciousness. Now I have a righteous conscience. I'm not aware of all the things that I do wrong, even though I do things wrong. But my, my abiding sense of awareness that I have in me is righteous. I'm righteous. And, and, and that, that has saved my life. Because, I mean, I, I'm like you. I've done things that, that I shouldn't have done. And it was, it was the message of righteousness that God revealed to me that has saved my life. Amen. And taught me how to live in front of God. Amen. You know, you, God's watching you all the time. We live in front of him all the time. Amen? And, and so I thank God for this message. But one of the big things that changed in the new covenant is prayer. We don't pray like a, an Old Testament saint prays. We don't take Old Testament uh, prayers that were written and prayed before this big change of the new covenant and pray them unless they fit the new covenant everything now has to filter through the finished work of jesus amen so when i pray i don't pray you know prayers like you know if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray you know stop sinning clean up do all this stuff then god said i will hear from heaven and i will that's an old covenant prayer somebody said well i like that prayer well, I like it too. It's in the Bible. But it's not one that I pray. Because it's an old covenant prayer. Because I'm different now. Amen? That's a prayer for a group of people or a nation to, to get qualified for God to move. If. That's, a, that's a, the qualification phrase, right? Isn't that what you tell your kids? If you do this, then I'll do that. You know, we lie to him and we say, if you're good, Santa Claus will come. It's conditional. And the Old Testament was conditional based on, the New Testament's conditional too, but the Old Covenant was conditional based on how well you obeyed the law and did everything right to uphold your end of the deal. But in the New Covenant, we don't have an end of the deal to hold up. Because the new covenant is not a covenant between us and God. We're included in it, but it's a covenant between the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He represented us as the Son of Man. So our covenant will never be broken. Because it's between two parties that cannot lie. That cannot, cannot miss it. Amen? We get included on the benefits if we're in Christ. If any man be in Christ... He's a new creature, right? right. So we're, when you get born again, you don't just get a ticket to heaven. You, you, you're baptized into Jesus. You're in Christ Jesus. He's in you. You're in him. You know, if I had a big old uh, jar of red dye up here and you could see in it, and I took a big white cloth, and I took that cloth and I baptized that cloth in that white dye, there's two things happening now. The cloth is in the dye, but now the dye is in the cloth. So when we get baptized into Jesus, we're in him and he's in us. There's a oneness that you just don't even, you can't even comprehend. That we're one with God through Jesus now. Amen. Jesus prayed that in the garden before he finished his finished work. He said, Father, make them one as you and I are one. And now we are. We're one with God through Jesus. Amen. I'm one with the Holy Spirit. He's living in me. I'm in him. He's in me. I'm in Jesus. Jesus is in me. Amen. 
I'm alive in God. So I'm baptized into Christ. I'm in Christ. So now that I'm in Christ, everything gets filtered through his finished work. So that's why it's so important to come to a church like this and find out what's a part of his finished work. Because that's where you live. That's what we're growing into. That's what we're renewing our mind by. That's what we're getting equipped by. We're finding out how to pray. So the Lord told us to, to write this book uh, from a new covenant perspective. Because when I, when I pray now in this new covenant, I'm not here on the earth praying for God to move. As much as I am seated with him in heavenly places, cooperating with him, he's cooperating with me in praying that his will would be done on the earth. I'm not a victim of the earth crying out for God to move. I'm seated with him in heavenly places, ruling and reigning in Christ. So, I, so authority is a big part of praying in the new covenant commanding and demanding based on what God wants to do. You find out what God wants to do because he re this is the way God's always moved. He reveals his will to man. Man prays and it gives God the, the right to move. It's the same thing. We're in the earth. We're not of the world, but we're in the earth, which gives us the right to stand in the gap for things on this earth. Amen. So we're, we're, we're praying. And, and so the Lord said, write a book on prayer and, uh, and, and write it from a perspective of praying from the new covenant, from being the righteousness of God, and, and, and write it in such a way that you can get it into nations where churches need to learn how to pray for their nation. Now, that's America. The church in America needs to learn how to pray for their nation, too. That's why we did it in English. <laughs> but, uh, but we also had a vision. The Lord spoke to us during that time of prayer. He said, the first nation I want you to get it into is Iran. And uh, print it in the, the Persian or the Farsi language. And, uh, and so we, I wrote the book. We, we got it published. Uh, uh, the publishing arm of TBN uh, published it. And, uh, and then we, the first thing we did is we went to the nation of Armenia. And we got them to, to take the book. Because we've worked with the publishing team there for many years. They took the book and they're, and they're translated, translating it into six other languages. So we got it translated into Farsi, and the first 1,000 uh, copies went into the nation of Iran. We're, right now we're waiting to hear back on the results of that because we have some friends of ours that are a team that they go in. Uh, some things have been real uh, up in the air about going into the nation of Iran lately, especially in the past few weeks. Uh, there's, a, there's a revolution going on right now, if you don't know. Uh, you may have seen some of it on the news, but there's a... They call it the women's revolution in Iran. And what it is is these, uh, these women are getting ticked off about having to wear these hijabs all the time. They have a, do you know they have a hijab police? And they, they go around watching women to make sure they're wearing their hijab right. Is that how you say it, hijab? What, whatever it is. You know, the big, I've been over there. It's kind of a scary thing. You know, when you walk down the road and, and more than half of the people that you walk by are clo clothed in black and all you can see is this much of their eyes. And you're thinking, who's in there? You know, is that a guy? Is that a girl? You know, what, what, what is going on? But it's, it's kind of a, a weird thing. And, and because of that, the women, uh, uh, the, the hijab police, uh, arrested a, a, a girl a few weeks ago and while she was in custody she was killed and it caused a lot of them to just get fed up with it and so now there's revolution going on you need to pray for the church in iran because a lot of this is not just about women's hijabs a lot of it is about the freedom of the gospel to go into that nation because god loves those people amen they're not the enemies of God. And, and if, even if they, they were, Jesus told us what to do to our enemies, right? Love them and bless them and get the gospel to them. So a thousand copies of this went into Iran. It's been translated also into Armenian. It's been translated into uh, Russian. It'll be translated into Turkish, Arabic, and Western Armenian. And, and then our goal is to strategize to get these books distributed uh, we don't have to distribute them in, in Iran. This, these other people um, 
they, they're, Armenia borders Iran, so they look alike. I would have a problem going into Iran. They would look at me and go, okay, something's up. Who are you? And it would cause red flags to go up. But these people go in and, and they, took, um, they took these in. And so this, this book is actually working right now in the nation of Iran. Glory to God. And, and they're learning how to pray. They're learning about new covenant realities. Praise God. And, uh, and so uh, we, have a, we have a few here today if, if any of you wants one. Uh, but they're available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. All right? Now, the preaching time starts now. <laughs> no, all of it was part. But let's, let's get into something just to, uh, for the next few minutes um, that I, I kind of was stirred up in my heart to get into in um, the book of Exodus 14. We're going to start there. Exodus 14. <clears throat> And it has to do with prayer. We need to be people of prayer. We need to pray. <clears throat> but we need to pray right. Jesus said this in John chapter 7. Or I mean John chapter 15. and verse 7. He said by this. Is my father glorified. That you would bear much fruit. So God is glorified. Not when you just have a few things happen in your life. But when you are real fruity. Right? When you, are, when you have, have you ever seen the, the pear trees in the fall that are just filled with big old pear trees, you know? We had those on our farm growing up. And, and I mean, they get so heavy that the branches touch the ground. And when I, when I picture being, uh, having a fruitful life, that's, where God, that's how God wants us to live. Not with just a few good things happening, but filled with fruit. Jesus said, this glorifies God when you are when, when you bear much fruit, when you have a lot of things happening in your life and, and, and God's moving in your life. And, and he said uh, ba that basically that scripture there in John 15, he's talking about prayer. He's, he's, he's dealing with the subject of prayer. And so, so what he's saying is, 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 by this is my father glorified that you would bear a lot of fruit in prayer, that you would pray and get results Anybody like results? Yeah. Amen. I, I, I'm an Alabama fan. I watched the game last night. <laughs> Roll Tide. And the dogs won too, so go dogs, you know. And, uh, and, uh, but I like the results. I like, did you like the results of the Georgia game? Oh, yeah. yeah? Yeah? Did you like the results of the Alabama? I don't care if you didn't like them or not. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm secure in who I am. I lived for three years in, in Gator territory. We pastored a church in Orlando, and, uh, and, and they did everything all kind. I mean, we, we got the persecution of being a Bama fan in Gator territory. We woke up one morning and looked outside, and there was an alligator in our front yard. And I, could have, I thought, somebody did this to me. They are so serious about converting me into being a Gator fan that they're putting gators in my front yard. But... Uh, <laughs> But uh, I like the results. I love results. I like to win. Anybody like to win? Yeah, yeah. I like the results when they're in my favor, right? <clears throat> and so I was, last night watching the Bama game, I was on the edge of my seat. That's about as close as you can come to losing as you want to get right there. You know, five seconds left, and your opponent is on the three-yard line about to score and mess you up. And thank God they didn't. God was with them. The Holy Ghost was there, and, <laughs> and so, but, I, you know, God is into results when we pray. So when we pray, prayer, your prayer life is, is, is really not worth anything if it doesn't get results. Amen? Now, I'm not just talking about praying for things and, and then getting those things. A lot of times results are answers when God talks to you about something that's a result amen uh, or, or when you when you have an encounter with the presence of God in prayer you know and you come away just drunk in the spirit you know that's that's results results are when you're believing God for something and that thing happens you're praying for somebody and it happens you're praying for something maybe you you do need some something material and you pray for it and it comes to pass. And here's the thing. That's the will of God. 
God never wants us or never desires for us to pray about anything without a full expectation that what we prayed for is going to come to pass. Paul said to the church at Philippi, he said, when I pray for you, I pray with joy. Why? Because, why I, because what I prayed is going to come to pass. Amen. Amen. So when, whether we're in intercession, whether we're praying and believing God for something, or we're just fellowshipping with God, God is into results. And so, you know, we, we all get in, in desperate situations uh, in life. We have things happen in our life. And sometimes, because we're, we're believers, and, you know, a lot of times we, we try to, we think we don't have any old tradition in our life, but we have probably more than we would like to, to admit when it comes to religious tradition. But the traditional thing to do when hell starts breaking loose in your life is to pray, right? I mean, things are happening, we need to pray. You know, things are falling apart, we need to pray. You know, we need a financial breakthrough, let's pray. But here's the thing I want to I get into today. Is prayer always the best thing to do? Look at this is a situation right here in Exodus chapter 14 where Moses got rebuked for praying. Will God rebuke people for praying? Would God ever rebuke you for praying? That's a question. Would he? I mean, if you went to God with a sincere heart and you just thought, well, I, I got to pray, would God ever say the same thing that he said to Moses right here in verse 15, Exodus 14, 15? See, Moses is, is, is going to God and crying out to him. And, you know, they just left Egypt. They get down to the Red Sea. There's mountains on the left and mountains on the right. They can't go that way. They can't go back because Pharaoh's coming after them now. And in front of them is the Red Sea. You would think if there's ever a time to pray, that's a time to pray, right? Let's, let's go, go to God. And so Moses goes to God and cries out to God. And God said in verse 15, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? <laughs> I just like to go to prayer one day, and, you know, start worshiping the Lord and, and, you, and you, you begin to get into what you're there for. And the Lord says, shut up. Basically what he said. What are you doing? Why are you crying to me? He said, tell the children of Israel to go forward. Now, the, the, the under, what's not said here that's very loud in these scriptures is Mo, God is talking to Moses like Moses knew what to do. And the reason he is is because he did know what to do. Because God knows what he's talking about, right? Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and pray that I would divide it. Is that what it says? No. He says, lift up your rod. Whose rod? Moses' rod. Stretch out your hand. Whose hand? Moses' hand. And divide it. Who's he telling to divide the water? Moses, and the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. Well, you, you know the story. They did that. Moses stretched out his rod, and, and the water heaped up on both sides and dried up. There's small wars fought on where, where that was in the Red Sea. Was it, you know, was it the, the deepest part of the sea, or this part of the sea that's like ankle deep, you know? And a lot of people say, well, that's where they went through, was where, where it was ankle deep, you know, so it wasn't really that big of a miracle. Well, then God drowned the whole Egyptian army in ankle deep water. That's even more of a miracle. <laughs> right? So it, it, it was, it was the, the, big enough to where the water walled up on both sides. That doesn't sound like ankle deep to me. But anyway, God did, you know, uh, supernatural things there. But uh, Moses got in trouble. God was grieved when Moses came to him in prayer. Now, listen to this. This is a, a quote by a man named John G. Lake. John G. Lake was born in like 1870. He died in like 1930. He was a missionary to South Africa 
it, it, his reputation is that he brought the Pentecostal movement and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, he brought that to the nation of, of Africa and was one of the main ones that introduced that. And now in Africa, I go to Africa every year, uh, now in Africa, it's different than here in the States because here in the States, the people that speak in tongues are the minority. You know, you got all the big, you know, Baptist and Methodist and Catholic and all these churches and their reputation is that they don't speak with tongues. And then you've got the small little spirit filled churches and, and Pentecostal churches and they're the tongue talkers, you know. So we're, we're the minority over here. But when you go to Africa, if you don't speak in tongues, you're the minority. That's just common in Africa. I mean, they just assume, if you're a believer, they assume you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit and you speak with tongues because, you know, that's part of the package. Here, religion has separated it to the point to where we, we think that it's okay to, to, to live without it. You can have it if you want or you can do without it, you know. You just, you know, it really doesn't matter. It does matter. Did you know that the entire New Testament was written presupposing that the reader has been baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues. The whole New Testament. Amen. But we, we've let religion steal that experience to the point to where the church in America is powerless because you're powerless without the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Your prayer life is a powerless prayer life unless you understand and, 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 are, and speak in tongues and, and, and flow in the Spirit like that. Amen. And also, I'll tell you what, it's also dry and boring. And I think people, if they were honest, they would admit that, right? And so, uh, you know, but, but in Africa, they just, they speak. John G. Lake was, was incredibly used in, in Africa. And, uh, and so he, he, he made this quote, and he, you know, he, he saw people raised from the dead, the, the big plague in Africa, he was the one that they, they put the, when people were dying, they were foaming at the mouth, you know, and they would take some of the foam and put it under the microscope and you could see the disease. And he's the one that told the doctors, put some of it on my hand and put it under the microscope. And when they did, they looked and, and the disease, once it made contact with his hand, it died. It's the law of life. Amen. The law of life in the spirit is that that, you know, in the Old Testament, if you touch something unclean, you became unclean. In the New Testament, whatever you touch lives. Amen. Amen. Big change. And so J John G. Lake said this, and if you want to write this down, I love this quote. He said, a weak Christianity is ever inclined to whine in prayer. There they got it on the screen. Thanks, God. A weak Christianity is ever inclined to whine in prayer while God waits for the believer to command it. Read that again. A weak Christianity is ever inclined to whine in prayer. Oh, God. We're just believing God. No, you're not. Believers command things. And they're joyful. And full of peace because they're in faith. While God waits for the believer to command it, to command it, to command it. Think about that. See, much of your prayer life is about commanding. Not, not just asking, it's commanding. You find out the will of God, then you stand before God and with God in, in your seat with Jesus, seated in heavenly places, looking down on the earth. Even though we live in the earth, we look down on the earth from our spiritual seat and we command in prayer. Amen. We demand for things to change and line up with the will of God. That's the way Jesus, you know, that's the way Jesus prayed the Lord's Prayer. You know, we think, what's the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be the name. You know, let's say it real religiously. <laughs> thy kingdom come. Thy will. Uh, my granddaddy, my great granddaddy used to pray that prayer. He would sit on the edge of his bed at night. And I lived with my grandmother for a lot, a lot of growing up. And I remember hearing my granddaddy sit on the edge of the prayer, edge of the bed at night, and he would say it until he got so senile that he couldn't remember it. And he would, uh, he would pray, you know, our Father, which art in heaven. And he'd stop, and then he would 
say a cuss word. I'm not going to tell you what he said. He was like, I <clears throat> can't remember. <laughs> he was very religious. When I played high school football, before every game, we'd say the Lord's Prayer. We'd gather around the goal, and when we were behind, I'd say it again. You know, like it was going like to change things. The, the Lord's Prayer, first of all, it's an, it's an uh, Old Testament prayer. It's not to be prayed today unless you change some things in it. You know, forgive us our trespasses. Well, we are forgiven in Jesus. Give us this day our daily bread. Well, he, he has already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. 2 Peter chapter 1. See, Jesus is on the old covenant side teaching them how to pray in that transitionary period between the old and the new. But when we get over in the new, we have to, we have to pray according to the new. Amen? So I'm not going to you know, uh, say, Lord, lead me not into temptation but deliver us from evil. I'm not going to pray that because I got New Testament scripture that tells me in Colossians chapter one that he has already delivered me from the power of darkness and translated me into the kingdom of his dear son. I got New Testament scripture that tells me what to do about the devil. Resist him steadfast in the faith. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will what? Flee. Flee. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you know, God do something about the devil. So it, God would rebuke you just like he rebuked Moses if you came to him and said, Lord, the devil's just eating my lunch. Would you just please do something about this? You know, that's what Paul did in, in, with the thorn in the flesh. He went to the Lord, he said three times. He said the thorn in the flesh was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. It was a demonic spirit that harassed him everywhere he was going, everywhere he would go and preach, there was, there was demonic, a demonic spirit sent from Satan, wasn't from God, the thorn in the flesh wasn't from God, it was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet or harass him. And he said, I went to God three times. Three times I entreated the Lord. Lord, do something about this. You know what God said to him? My grace is sufficient. In other words, what I have already done is enough for you to take care of this, Paul. That's what he said. He said, I, I went to him three times. He didn't have any pity on me, didn't have any compassion on me. All he said was, what I did was enough. My finished work was enough. The grace that's available to you in Christ is enough to take care of this situation. Now get up and do something about it. So you can't go to God and ask, ask him to do something about the devil. Lord, there's, there's just all these attacks. Would you just, you know, one person, I heard one preacher say that a lady came to him one time and said, you know, I'm under all these attacks. Just pray that the Lord would take half of them off. I believe I could bear half of them. <laughs> well, he wants them all off, but he's already done everything he's going to do about the devil in your life. And so now he's given you the authority to command it. Yes. Amen. A weak Christianity whines to God in prayer while God waits for the believer to command it. Amen. So if you were going to put a title of what I'm talking to, the title would be quit praying. Because there's a lot of prayer that's going on that needs to stop. Because, you know, here's the thing. When, when God has already given to you, and I'm... I'm speeding some of this up for the sake of time because y'all took up so much time with the book that I got to speed this up. When God has given you a promise in the new covenant, when he's given you a promise, he really doesn't want to talk to you anymore about it. Because that's what a lot of people's prayer life normally is, is just I'm just going to go and talk to God about this. He's already talked to you. So what's he waiting on you to do? He's waiting on you to step out in faith and act and begin to command it. Amen. When God's given you a promise, I remember the story, I came up under Kenneth Hagin and uh, went to his Bible school and followed his ministry uh, 
until he went to heaven and still follow it today. But uh, I remember Brother Hagin talking about some meetings that they used to have when he was pastoring. And he would look out at the congregation and see the bondage that some of the people had in their life and the different things that they were going through. And so he came up with the idea, we're going to have uh, some special prayer meetings. And we're going to call them deliverance meetings. And we're going to come and we're going to worship the Lord, share some scriptures, and then we're going to pray for people to be delivered. Sounds like a good idea. And so they, they did. They had the meetings and people came and they prayed and they got some temporary results with people. And then he said, later I look at my people and they were still having the same problems. He said, well, maybe we need to have some, some different kind of services. Let's have some getting free services. So they'd have some kind of Holy Ghost type services where they would come and let the Spirit of God move, you know, and they'd pray for people, lay hands on people. And people would shout and people would fall and people would, you know, some people got some results and then weeks went by and the people were still having the same problems. You know, they got some temporary relief, but they're, but they're not, they're not free. They're not delivered, you know. So they, he said, well, maybe we need to have some different kind of services. So this is a true story. He, this happened in his church. He said, so later, and this is weeks, you know, went by. We started having services called loosening services. You know, whatever you bind on earth, you bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, will be loosed in heaven. So we're going to pray for people to be loosed from their problems and loosed from their bondage. And so, <clears throat> so they would have the services. People would come up. They'd lay hands on them. And then, you know, some results, but not many results. Later on, he said the people were having the same problem. He said he began to seek the Lord about that. Because they were doing a lot of praying, a lot of laying hands on people. And he said, the Lord spoke to him and he said, he said, you're trying to accomplish through prayer what can only be accomplished through boldly acting on my word. I don't know if you got that or not. He said, you're trying to accomplish through prayer what can only be accomplished by boldly acting on my word. Boldly acting on the word. What are we talking about? We're talking about the, the, now when you pray, you need to pray in faith. But many times when you're in faith, you don't need to pray. You just need to act on the word. You just need to put the word into practice. You need to start being a doer of the word. And, and not just to hear of it and not thinking that, you know, whenever I have a need, all I've got to do is go to God in prayer and we can take care of this. Well, Moses thought the same thing. And the Lord said, what are you doing? What, what are you here for? Why are you here? Why are you crying to me? Take what I've given you. The reason is why the reason Moses got in trouble. God had given him a rod and that rod was to be used on anything that contradicted what God wanted him to accomplish. Right? Remember when he gave him the rod? You know, threw it down in front of Pharaoh, became a snake. Took it back up, became a rod again. It was a supernatural signet. It was a supernatural uh, 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 thing that God gave him that, was, that represented the authority of God. That nothing can stand in front of what God wants to do. And so that's why God said to Moses, why are you crying to me? Take your rod and stretch it out over the water. You got a water problem, but you got a rod. Take the rod and take care of the water problem. <laughs> right? It, I mean, when I read this, I almost hear God going, duh. Right? That's kind of what I, I, I sense, you know, that, that God is going, Moses, I gave you the rod. Now do something about this. And he took it. He stretched it out over the water and he divided the water. He didn't pray that God would divide it. He stretched it out over the water. Go, go to 1 Corinthians and I'll, I'll close with this scripture. I'll, I'll make reference to a, a couple more, but I'll, I'll close with 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Remember in Acts chapter uh, 3, you go to 1 Corinthians, I'm, but, but remember in Acts chapter 3 when Peter and John were on the way to the temple, hour of prayer, they're going there to pray, 
And they pass this guy that's been sat daily, uh, every day, at the gate called Beautiful. And this guy looks at Peter and John and asks them for, for an, you know, some help. Can you help me? Do you have anything you can get? Alms is what the Bible says. But it just, same thing that happens to you when you, most of the time when you go into downtown Atlanta. Somebody's going to come up to you and say, can I, you got five dollars, you know. So here's a guy, all, he can't walk, all he can do is beg. So they set him there every day and he, and he begins to, he sees Peter and John coming and he asks them for money. And Peter must have had, the Holy Spirit must have rose up in him. Peter looked at him and said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. Is that what happened? Go back and read it's exactly what happened. What happened to the man when he said, get up and walk? No, actually nothing happened. He said, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. I don't know how much of a period of time there was between him saying that and him walking over to the man and grabbing him by the right hand and pulling him up. That, that's beyond prayer. And this is what we're talking about this morning, is that the miraculous, there's a key to the miraculous, and it's boldness. Boldness. It took boldness to walk over to a man that has never walked and grab him by the hand and pull him up. Amen. We had a guy in our church, uh, an evangelist come and preach years ago, and, and uh, he was known for just crazy miracles that would happen in his life. I mean, he had w one lady that he prayed for. Uh, she came up and he asked her what the problem was and she pulled her pants back and, her, and she had no muscle in her leg. It was like the muscle had been, he said it looked like somebody had taken a butcher knife and just carved the muscle out. And it was just bones. And, uh, and he, he prayed for her and, and muscle actually came into her legs right then. I mean, appeared right there, supernaturally. The whole church saw it. He was in another church, and, and, uh, and this lady came up, uh, and, and she had a cane. And, uh, and this guy was just known for being, he was almost known for being ugly and, and mean. But he was just bold. And he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he had a reputation for despising unbelief, and he just... You know, his job was to get people into faith and call him what you want. He had some crazy miracles take place. And so he grabs this older lady with a cane, throws her cane down, and starts running around the church with her. Now, we've seen meetings like that when that's happened. The only difference was this lady is screaming, Stop! 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 And he's dragging her. He's got her. He's pulling her around, and she's... And she's Screaming the whole now, what would you do if you were in a service like that? You'd want to crawl up under the chair when you're like, what, what is fixing to happen here? And she's, stop, stop, stop. And, and I think you said about three quarters around the church as he's pulling this lady around, the power of God hit her and she was completely healed. Boldness. Well, this is what happened here in Acts chapter 3. He walks over to this man. He says, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And the man probably just blinked at him and looked. And Peter thought, no, I, I use the name of Jesus, bless God, which is the name that's above every name and the name that's above the, the crippling whatever that's going on in your, in your body. So he walks over to the man, grabs his hand. Go back and read it. It's in Acts chapter 3. Sometimes we just kind of read over these things. He pulled the man up by his hand. When was the man healed? Because he was healed. He was healed when Peter boldly acted on what he believed. No prayer. They didn't lay hands on him and say, Father, we just ask you to come with your power and heal this. No, if they'd have prayed that kind of prayer, it would have been an unscriptural prayer of unbelief. Because what does God want us to believe? That he's given us the authority. Amen? Amen. He's given us the power. You know, Jesus commissioned us to go into all the world, preach the gospel, and, and, to, and to heal the sick. He didn't say pray that God would heal the sick. 
He said, you go heal the sick. Because he gave you the power. There's power in you to drive cancer out of people. There's power in me to raise up people that can't walk. There's power in us. Amen. Do you really believe that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world? Do you really believe that the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead lives in you? Amen. See, we've we got to ask ourselves the question, do we really believe these things? Because sometimes we're using prayer to dodge the act of faith. Well, let me just pray for you. When God wants you to snatch them up. Amen. When God wants you to, you know, work a miracle. Heal the sick. He told his disciples, you know, when he commissioned his power to them, he said, he said, go and tell them, the, go heal the sick and tell them this is the kingdom. This is the kingdom of God. And what if they'd have gone in and, and, and said, you know, and, and prayed, God, I know you told us to go heal the sick, but we're asking you to come with your glory and your power. We can make prayers real pretty, can't we? When God just wants us to do the works that he did and greater works than these because he went to the Father. Amen? Do you find 1 Corinthians? I'm closing with this. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1. So I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Second letter Paul wrote to this church. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. Just one scripture. For all the promises of God are in him, what? Yes, and amen. To the glory of God through us. Now, first thing to notice about here, about this, for all the promises of God in him. So anything that God has promised, and the key word here is in him, that means it refers to the finished work. It refers to the new covenant inheritance that we have as a result of what Jesus did. So any promise that's concerned in the finished work is what? Yes. Which means God will never say no. Right? You have a promise that God will never say no when you come to him and approach him based on the finished work of Jesus claiming something that he has already given you. So when you say that the most important thing in life is finding out what belongs to you, right? How'd you like to, you know, live all your life and you get to where you're in your last maybe year of life and you find out from one of your relatives that they left you this huge inheritance when you were 25 years old. And now your life is over. And you could have lived life really well on the earth. Had whatever you wanted to have. That's what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. When we realize what we could have had here on the earth. I believe that's when he will wipe away every tear. When we realize what we could have had and how we could have lived on the earth. What belonged to us. Amen. So the promises of God are in him. Yes, God will never say no to a promise. God will never say wait on a promise. God will never say not this time on a promise. God will always say yes when it's concerned in a promise. They're yes and amen. All the promises of God are yes and amen to the glory of God. That means God did this so that he could be glorified. Amen? He wants your life filled with fruit because it glorifies him. When you bear much fruit, it glorifies him when you work miracles. It glorifies him when you, you know, pick up crippled people like Peter and John did. It glorifies him when people get results. It glorifies him when you bring the, the gospel of, of grace and salvation to people and they get born again. It glorifies God. Amen. But don't you notice the last part of this verse? This verse. All the promises of God are yes and amen. To the glory of God through us. Through us. Why? Because that's the only way God's going to do it. It's through us, through the church. We are the answer to the world's problem. Amen. 
He didn't do it. He, he won't do it with, by an angel. You know, the angel came to, to, uh, to Cornelius, who was a, you know, righteous man, gave lots of alms. His alms came up before God. God told Cornelius, who was a Gentile, right in the early part of the books of, book of Acts. And he said, go and send for Peter, who was on a housetop praying. And so he went and made the long trek down there. Got Peter. Peter came back, preached the gospel. You know the story. The Holy Ghost fell. They all began to speak with tongues, and his whole household was saved. You think, God could have saved a lot of time by just letting the angel that came to Cornelius in the first place, just let the angel preach the gospel to him. That's not the job of angels. That's why this whole thing had to happen. Why? Because all the promises of God or in him, yes and amen, to the glory of God through us, through you, through me. Amen? How many of you desire for God to just really use you in these last days? I do. I don't want God to use, I want to, I want to see, and not so I can be glorified. I want to see him glorified. I want to see people get crazy about Jesus. Amen? I want to see nations shaken. That's why when we wrote this, this book, we put on the front of it, Life Transforming and Nation Shaking Prayer. You can pray nation shaking prayers from McDonough, Georgia. And they can have an impact in Moscow, Russia. If you know how to pray. Now, because a lot of, now, we're not talking about prayer traditionally going to God and asking God, but going to God and commanding. Amen. To the glory of God through us. Let's ask God to use us more. Let's let that be our prayer today when we, before we go. Would that be all right? Let's stand up and, and let's just ask God to just give us boldness. You know, that's what the church did in Acts chapter 4. They began to get persecuted. They were trying to stamp the, the, the message out, you know, and quieten the church down. Acts chapter 4, they went to God and they said, God, you're the one that created everything. Behold their threats and give us boldness that we may speak your word by stretching forth your hand to heal. The signs and wonders may be done through the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, in, in the name of Jesus, we pray that this morning. Lord, we stand before